Good afternoon. My name is Christina Lawson. I'm the chair of uh, Panel B of the Medical Board of California. I'd like to call uh, this meeting to order. It is, well, it's 1.29, so we'll technically call it to order at 1.30 in about 30 seconds. Um, I would like to introduce Judge uh, Schlichtman, uh, who is going to be presiding um, over the first oral argument on non-adopted proposed decision. Go ahead. Yes, please. All right. Good afternoon. We are on the record in the matter of the accusation against Harold. Me, roll call. I'm sorry, I forgot oh, roll call. Okay. okay. Ms. Lawson? Here. Dr. Bola? Here. Dr. Nandev? Here. Dr. Kraus? Present. Dr. Levine? Ms. Pines? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Okay, now we're ready. Now we are on the record in the matter of the accusation against Harold T. Peart, MD. This matter has been assigned Medical Board Case Number 800-2015-016457 and Office of Administrative Hearings Case Number 2018-061078. Today's date is July 25, 2018. My name is Jill Schlickman. I'm the Administrative Law Judge who has been assigned by the Office of Administrative Hearings to uh, preside over this proceeding today. At this time, I will take the appearances for the record, starting with the Attorney General's office. Good afternoon. Claudia Ramirez, Deputy Attorney General, appearing on behalf of Kimberly Kirkmeyer, Executive Director of the Medical Board of California. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Henry Fenton, and I'm here appearing with Dr. Peart, who's coming. He's, he's the, the physician who's accused, and he's come here with me today. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, in making your presentations, you should bear in mind that the board members have read your written argument and that argument may be based only on the existing record. Each side will be allowed 15 minutes for opening argument and five minutes for closing argument. After the hearing, the board will meet in closed session for deliberations. The decision will not be announced today. A written decision will be mailed to you as soon as possible. So at this time, I'm going to ask Dr. Peart to be sworn in case he's asked any questions or decides to make a statement. Would you raise your right hand, please, sir? Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that your testimony in this proceeding will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right, thank you. Okay, so uh, Mr. Fenton, I'm going to uh, give you 15 minutes to make your argument. So you can go ahead. Thank you. I'm very pleased to be here today with Dr. Peer because knowing him and knowing his background, I think he's an excellent physician who made an error, and I think any physician in their career can make an error. This was with respect to a patient, SD, who he had known. He had delivered two of her children. And she came to him in 2015. Um, she came to him in, and, and by the way, in those instances, there was no. They, they looked at the um, the prenatal blood re records. Everything was perfect in terms of the records with respect to this patient, vis-a-vis -vis the first two <coughs> children she delivered for her. She came to him in 2015. She, the first time she came was in October of 2015, and at that, when she came to see if she was pregnant, and the pregnancy was confirmed in his office. At that time, he did, and, and the record is, and this I think is in the decision, it's undisputed, he did a bimanual exam, and, and he did a, an ultrasound, a vaginal ultrasound at that time, which was, which was his, his practice. And I think it was, uh, the, 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 the uterus I think was seven millimeters, something like that, in October of 2015. The patient didn't come back for her for scheduled appointment in November. Um, she didn't come back. She came back again in December. And this is, as I say, somebody that the doctor knew. He delivered the two babies. There, there, there was a, 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 discrep a difference in, in, in recollection and testimony at the hearing. Dr. Dr. Peart recalls his testimony was that, that the patient wasn't certain that she wanted to keep this, this baby patient denied that at the hearing. But in any event, she didn't come back. She first came in in October of 2015. Then she came back in December 
He didn't come back in November. He came back in December. He examined her again, and he ascertained, and I'm not, I'm not a physician or an OBGYN, but from that, having been in the case, this is what I understand. He ascertained that the, the uterus hadn't grown. It, it, it appeared to be just about the same size. He did, the, the first time he did a, oh, and he did a vaginal ultrasound back in October 2015. He didn't really see anything in terms of, he didn't see that the, the patient was pregnant. She, by the way, the other thing is she came in and it's undisputed, she was morbidly obese, which was a diff very different condition than when she presented and had her first two kids. This time when she came in October 2015, she was morbidly obese, and there's no dispute about that. And that made it virtually impossible. He, he examined her, he didn't, he, he, from the uterus, he couldn't conclude that there was a live fetus in there. And also, when he examined her, he examined her in October, then he examined her again when she came in in December, and he couldn't determine from his bimanual exam or the vaginal, he did a, he did a vag vaginal ultrasound that there was a live fetus in there, and he concluded, and, and his, his recollection was that she wasn't sure that she wanted to do that, and he didn't, he didn't do all of the blood, this is on one patient, this whole case, concerns this one patient, HD. He didn't do the blood panels at this time, although the chart shows that when he, when he saw her earlier, he'd always done the prenatal, pre prenatal blood tests. He had done them, but in this instance, his recollection is that the patient wasn't sure she wanted to have the baby. So in any event, he decided he was gonna do HCG levels to see if she, he, he had done, he had done, he had done the, the, two, the ultrasounds both in October and December, he was, he was going to do HCG levels to see if that would help him determine whether she had a, a, a live fetus in there or whether it was a missed abortion. And the HCG levels at 12 weeks was low, was, was quite low, and it kind of confirmed, it confirmed in his mind that this, this baby, this, that this was a failed, a, a failed pregnancy. Now, when we got the case, he, he, he conceded, he told me, he, he had made a mistake, and, and these were the circumstances. And we, and we sent it over to uh, an expert reviewer, Dr. Mandel, who's, who's, who's an excellent reviewer, excellent credential. The criticism from the medical board was uh, by uh, their, their uh, expert, Dr. Gustafson, who hadn't done ultrasounds at all in his office for the last 10 or 15 years. The criticism was that he should have done an abdominal ultrasound. Because what happened was, the upshot is, as, as you may know, he, the, the patient, he told the patient that she had, that, that, she, that, that she didn't have a life, that, that, he, that, that, he was, that the, the, the baby was, that there was no live fetus in there in, in December, but then she came in and, and, he, and, he, and, he, and he performed a, a, a procedure thinking that, that, she, that she didn't have a live pregnancy. But she went to Kaiser a week later in January, and they did a, a they did a um, an ultrasound, a vaginal ultrasound, and couldn't see anything either, just like he couldn't. But then they did a abdominal ultrasound, and there they saw that there was a, a, a live fetus in there. So that's what led to this case. This was like in the middle of January. Now he 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 knew that he made a mistake, but I know that that Dr. Mandel said, I don't think this is really negligence because he examined her twice. She was very, very difficult to examine. Um, he, he, did, he, 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 he couldn't see a fetus. He did the blood test. It indicated it was very low, which indicated to, to him that the patient um, didn't have a live fetus in, in the uterus and that there was no negligence. And, and, um, in any event, Judge Garrett ruled against us and said there was, that he, and, and, and he doesn't contest the fact, and, 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 I, and he learned from it, that, that there was an error made. But the, the background of this is that, <clears throat> you know, the, the doctor, what you should know is that although we disagree with Judge Garrett's conclusion that Dr. Was negligent because I thought that Mandel, Dr. Mandel's background was, was better, much better than their expert. And he said, Yes, this mistake was made, but I don't think there was any negligence because, under these circumstances, it was reasonable for him 
not to have done abdominal ultrasound because the pubic bone is in the way until 14 weeks. That's what Mandel said. So it wouldn't have shown him anything, that the abdominal ultrasound. And, and he had done the, the exams, he had done the ultrasounds, and under all of these circumstances, it was reasonable for him to have concluded that there was no live pregnancy, even though it was definitely mistaken. But in any event, D Judge Garrett determined that he was grossly negligent, but with respect to the issue of penalty, and we think that's what you're all concerned about, we think that her opinion, her opinion clearly and correctly sets forth the reasons why no greater discipline should be imposed than what she has recommended. Now, as, as we know, he's, Dr. Peart is a board-certified OBGYN. After obtaining his bachelor's degree and master's of science from Howard University, he earned his MD degree from the Columbia University. He went on and then finished his internship and residency at Martin Luther King, and has been in private practice of OBGYN since 1982, a very distinguished practice. He, he became board certified right away in 1980, 1984. And he, he had been practicing at the time, and as of 2015, he practiced for 36 years without any medical board charges, without any problems. He had delivered 15 to 18,000 babies. Now, in the three years since 2015, it's probably over 20,000 babies. This is the only case where there's ever been an issue with respect to, to Dr. Peart. Now, he, he's been recognized by his peers at Cedars-Sinai, Cedars and that's one of the best hospitals, I think, in this country, and they, they demand the best treatment. And, 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 and he has been there for many, many years. He's been recognized as an outstanding obst obstetrician gynecologist, as Judge Garrett set forth in finding number four of her proposed decision, he currently serves on the Cedar sinai Health Associated Physician Advisory and Integration Council, as well as the Cedar sinai Health Associated Medical Board. In 2016, he was awarded Physician of the Year by Cedar sinai Obstetricians. So that's the kind of quality. He's always delivering there, and they see what kind of a person this is. And in 2007, by Cedar sinai Labor and Delivery Nurses. He has also been honored with a number of other awards and acknowledgments during his years as a physician, and this is what, what, uh, what the judge, Judge Garrett in this case, did. And I think she's an excellent judge, even though I didn't agree with her decision because I've had her before. Uh, now, moreover, we have two witnesses who've worked with him for many years. Samuel, Dr. Samuel Porter is an OBGYN who's been practicing since 1972, has performed hundreds of surgeries with Dr. Beard. And he, he said that they've assisted each other on numerous cases. He testified that Dr. Beard is regarded as a physician with an excellent reputation at Cedars and among the doctors, and that he even delivered Dr. Porter's granddaughter, that he referred his granddaughter and his daughter to Dr. Peart because of the excellence of, of, of his work and his career as, a, as an OBGYN. And he's known him, and then, and then the, other, the other witness that testified for him was a younger physician, Dr. Regina Edmund, an OBGYN in practice for 10 years, and she has known him since her residency. She, said, she testified she's assisted him on many of his surgeries at Cedars, she described him, quote, as a great surgeon and physician, as well-liked among residents and doctors at Cedars-Sinai, and takes care of some of the sickest patients with complicated pregnancies. Now, in paragraph 21 of her decision, Judge Garrett explained that given Dr. Peart's long period of practice with no record of discipline, and, and based on, on, on her findings of, on, of the many hundreds, thousands of patients he has treated and the proven and that the proven the way she put it the proven unprofessional conduct in this matter concerned only one patient JD and given that he's had thousands where this has never happened so he, he, a mistake was and um, and given given his testimony that now and this, this was his testimony whenever he encounters something in a patient's pregnancy that's different from what he expects, he sends the patient out for a second opinion. 
And this is particularly true for, the, oh, we, we have here a very discrete issue, which is this delivery where somebody comes in, it was very hard to diagnose because of the patient's condition and she didn't come in and so forth, and he made a mistake. And, and he, he, he says if they come in and it's different from what he expects in any way, he sends the patient out for a second opinion. And Judge Garrett explained that given these factors, and given that the purpose of disciplinary action is protection of the public, not punishment, she concluded that the public would be adequately protected by the imposition of a two-year probationary term, including a condition concerning education. Now, at the hearing, this is important. What Dr. Peer testified to was, quote, that if a patient like SD presented to him today, he would send her out to a radiologist or perinatologist for a formal ultrasound to confirm or deny his suspicion of an abnormal fetus or pregnancy and would not rely on SHCG levels. We just have two minutes left. Okay. okay. So, so what, I, what I wanted to say was that, that he, he, he knows his error. He's extraordinary. Um, now, on top of the, these other, we have the other awards. He's been awarded the Teaching Appreciation Award by Charles Drew University from 2010 to 2011. He teaches residents and doctors. He's a, he's a shining example for young physicians and minority physicians of what you can achieve and how hard he's worked in his career and what he's achieved with this one error and this one mistake. And he, he has served as the Assistant Residency Director of Cedar sinai Residents. He's a member of the Cedar sinai Medical Executive Committee and President of the, he was President of the Los Angeles Obstetrical and Gynecological Society in 2001 to 2002. So I, I, I submit to you, he wouldn't have achieved these things if he were somebody who, who wasn't concerned. There's no showing of anything other than a mistake in this one single case. And as I said, we had an excellent expert who didn't even think there was negligence in this instance. But the doctor has learned what he needed to do, and if we just punish him for no particular reason to increase the probation that the Attorney General is recommending to slap on three more years. I mean, this is a man who's been in practice for many, many years, for 35, 40 years, and he's excellent, and he knows he made the mistake, and he's made the adjustments. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Ramirez, let me go ahead. Yes, um, good afternoon. <clears throat> the proposed penalty of two years and an education course is inadequate to protect the public. Um, if we look at the uh, disciplinary guidelines, the disciplinary guidelines uh, indicate that the minimum probationary period is five years, along with other terms and, and conditions. And the um, California Code of Regulations, um, Title 16, Section 1361, indicates that the board shall consider the manual model disciplinary uh, guidelines and in, in, um, orders and disciplinary guidelines in reaching um, its decision. And that there um, should be some indication for um, deviating from those guidelines. For example, presence of mitigating factors, the age of the case, or evidentiary um, problems. And uh, we don't have those um, in this case. In this case, respondent is a board certified OBGYN. He's also a primary care physician, and SD had been his patient since 2011. He delivered two of her children and she specifically sought prenatal care from the respondent for um, her pregnancy. In this case, the departures were serious in nature. Uh, it included the failure to perform an order or order an abdominal ultrasound, the mistaken ass assumption concerning um, ACG titers. He thought that they were indicative of a missed abortion and that they were fall um, falling because of that, and instead they were falling because the patient was in the second um, trimester, or progressing on to the sec second trimester, and then eventually had moved on to the second trimester. Um, there's also a mistaken as assumption that she was in the first trimester, when in fact she was at, 
initially at the border and then had eventually progressed into the second trimester. And then finally, there's the incorrect diagnosis that she had a missed abortion. We have serious consequences in this case. Um, we have a death of a 20-week-old fetus, although the board typically doesn't consider injury or harm. Um, the, the, it is a, a consideration in imposing the appropriate uh, penalty. And while um, it, it seems like the respondent is accepting responsibility for his mistake, he still continues to blame the patient in that he's uh, disputing the judge's um, finding of gross negligence against him and finding of repeated negligent acts against him. Um, in, in his uh, brief, he claimed that SD was, was a complicated patient, um, that she was not complying because she missed an appointment. Um, he makes other excuses that she was overweight and that she didn't want the pregnancy. Um, and I had to, um, the, the complainant had to go through the unusual step of calling SD to um, come in and testify um, to uh, rebut the allegations that he raised um, in his defense uh, hearing and, and that he continues to uh, assert today um, in, his, uh, in his written argument and to some extent in his oral argument. So there's some um, indication of not accepting a full and complete <coughs> responsibility for the, the mistake. Um, John, uh, one, one uh, correction as to our expert, um, John Gustav's son, he indicated that although he does not perform um, the vaginal or abdominal ultrasounds in his office, he does perform them at the hospital during the labor and, and delivery, so it's, it's not accurate that he doesn't have experience performing them. Um, but nevertheless, the important point is that he knows, he recognizes when those ultrasounds are necessary in providing prenatal care to patients. Um, doctor, with respect to the respondent's expert, Howard Mandel, uh, whatever his experience and qualifications are, his opinions were simply unsupported by the evidence. Um, he testified that performing an abdominal ultrasound would not have yielded clear, clear results because of the potential of pubic bone obstruction. Um, he did state that uh, results would have been better had the abdominal ultrasound been performed at a later date. And uh, by the time that the patient had the DNC, uh, she was um, more than 17 weeks pregnant. So it, it could have been performed at, a, at some point where um, the fetus would have been visible and, and, the, and the heart tone could have been heard. Um, so that's just one example of how his his opinion is um, was unsupported um, by the evidence. He also um, asserted that the patient did not want uh, the pregnancy as a reason for not um, requiring requiring prenatal blood studies. Uh, but the evidence showed um, through Esther's testimony and even the respondent's failure to document any uh, of such indication that she did not want um, the pregnancy. So again, no matter what Dr. Mandela's qualifications might have been, you know, the evidence is the evidence and it's, and it's undisputed and in favor of the uh, complainant. Um, as far as the character witnesses are concerned, um, they have not personally observed the respondent providing prenatal care to patients. Um, and so that was a consideration that was raised in the um, judge's opinion. So um, based on the foregoing, um, the complainant believes that the five years probation um, would be a more appropriate a probationary term for uh, for this case should um, the respondent comply with the terms and conditions of, an, of his probation he can always seek um, to an early pursue an early petition for termination of probation after two years so that's uh, an alternative uh, 
a PACE, if you were to attend a PACE, then um, the board would be able to um, make sure that he um, is practicing um, within, um, would be able to determine whether or not he has the competency to be able to practice within the standard of care. Uh, a medical record keeping course is absolutely necessary given the um, inadequate documentation in this case. And A practice monitor would also um, supervise his practice throughout the um, duration of the probation to make sure that he's in, in compliance with the standard of care. And so, um, for, so for that reason, we ask that the uh, penalty in this case be increased. All right, thank you very much. Mr. Fenton, you're closing? Uh, yes, I, I, I wanted to remarks that council will brief and I just have a brief reply. Um, first, I, I think there were, there were mitigating circumstances and Judge Garrett set them forth that this is really a single patient case for this one patient. After many, many, many years of practice, having to order thousands of patients and uh, with, under unusual circumstances where we had an excellent expert even, even opine that there, there was really no negligence, there was, there was simply an error. Uh, it isn't true that it, our brief, we're, that's a lawyer's brief, but, but it isn't true in, to any extent that the doctor doesn't recognize that he made a mistake and, and, and in no way has he blamed the patient whatsoever in this case. Uh, for lawyers, we make our arguments and so forth, and, but that's, that's, not, that's not the doctor. And, and as lawyers, we, 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 <laughs> we disagree with the decision, but, but the doctor recognized that he was wrong. Um, and <clears throat> there, there is, the doctor would not benefit in any way in practice for so many years. This is a discrete issue having to do with this one patient where he didn't do the abdominal ultrasound. He's addressed it and he's going to do that. He doesn't need to have more years of probation. That would just be punitive. It wouldn't accomplish anything for somebody at his, at his point in his career. And, 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 and the fact that, that he has been an excellent doctor. Um, it's undisputed for many, many years, except in this one instance where there was an error made. So we, we, we see no reason, it would just be humiliating and difficult for him, and no reason to protect the public for him to have to have a monitor or to go through a, an assessment program. He, he understands completely, and he set forth it's in the decision that he, he's going to make sure he's going to have someone take a, a second look at it when there's any kind of an issue like this in the future. And that's not really the only thing that's involved. The, 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 there, was a, there was a negligence count having to do with the prenatal care, but again, you know, that's another issue. He does prenatal care for his patients. He did for that patient. Maybe there was a misunderstanding with this single patient. But, but in any event, there's no question that, 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 that he does it, and he doesn't need to have a record keeping. Of course, he knows how to keep records, and he doesn't need to have a monitor. I thank you very much. Thank you. All right, Ms. Ramirez, your closing thoughts? I um, just based on what we um, previously indicated, um, you know, again, uh, perhaps um, the lawyers are making the arguments on behalf of the respondent, but um, given his uh, testimony um, at the hearing, um, as well as his expert's opinion, there was an indication then and an indication now that he uh, continues to uh, not accept full responsibility for um, for his um, unprofessional conduct, and so um, the mitigating evidence was is insufficient to uh, justify a deviating um, from the uh, five year from the five years minimum of um, probation. In this case, the judge uh, is proposing uh, two years. Two years is his way to um, 
low years of probation given um, the uh, severe consequences in, in this case um, and the, the failure to um, just uh, recognize the, the need for an, an ultrasound um, just to, uh, you know, the, the testimony during the hearing was that the doctors rely on ultrasounds uh, particularly when you do have uh, patients who are um, overweight as SD was. Um, you um, have to look to your tools, what tools you have to, um, to help you uh, in caring for the patient. And that was uh, one of them. And he um, actually sought out to prove to the patient that she had a missed abortion. Um, and so there, there is a, a concern um, uh, as to failure to recognize red flags in the care and treatment of the, of the patient um, and uh, attending the PACE program would flesh out any concerns with the respondent's ability to practice um, safely. There were record keeping issues in this case. Um, for example, uh, not, you know, the respondent claims that the patient didn't want the pregnancy or if that was the case that's not documented in the, in the medical records. The doctor performed a suction curtage, not a sharp curtage. Well, that's not documented in the medical records. So the discipline that the complainant is requesting is um, tied specifically to the concerns that are uh, were raised in, in this case. Um, and so for that reason, we ask that the court, that the board impose the, the discipline that's being requested. All right, thank you very much. Chair Lawson, did you have any questions for the parties? I do not. All right, Dr. Bellat. Dr. Krauss, yes. Thank you, Judge Slickman. Uh, respecting that Mr. Fenton did not utilize his full five minute response time, I would hope that we might invite Dr. Peart to make a statement if he so wishes. Dr. Peart, would you like to make a statement to the board? that I made a mistake. Uh, in the 36 years that I've practiced, I've always tried to uh, do what I thought was correct. In this situation, at the time that it happened, I look back and I realize I made a mistake. And I think we always hate to make mistakes. Uh, I admit that it was a mistake and I see what I did wrong. Uh, and I, it has never happened to me before, and I hope it never happens again. Uh, but I, I'm not trying to blame the patient for anything that happened. It was all done by what I did, not what the patient did. And I uh, hope that you realize that I'm really sorry that it happened. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Mm -hmm. the board? And at this time, we will close the hearing and we're off the record. I'm Christina Lawson. I'm the chair of Panel B of the Medical Board of California. We are here on um, item three, oral argument on non-adopted proposed decision in the matter of Brandon Michael Ross. Just going to note for the record that it is 2.30. We are starting um, slightly early, but we have confirmed that all parties are present uh, and ready to proceed. Uh, I'd now like to introduce Administrative Law Judge Schlickman. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we are on the record in the matter of the petition for reinstatement of the surrendered license of Brandon Michael Ross. This matter has been assigned Medical Board Case Number 800-2017-030402 and Office of Administrative Hearings Case Number 2018-061229. Today's date is July 25, 2018. My name is Jill Schlipman. I'm the Administrative Law Judge with the Office of Administrative Hearings and today I have been assigned to preside over this proceeding. At this time, I will take the appearances for the record, starting with the Attorney General's office. Rose Luzon, Deputy Attorney General, appearing on behalf of the state, people of the state of California. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Steve Zygen representing Mr. Ross, who is seated next to me at council table. All right. 
right, thank you. So um, each party will be permitted 15 minutes for opening argument and five minutes for closing argument. And I understand, uh, Mr. Zygen, that you would like, you would prefer to go second instead of first, is that right? That's correct, Your Honor. Um, the order from the board incorrectly noted that Mr. Ross was a respondent. He is, in fact, a petitioner. As petitioner, he has the burden, just like we did at hearing, of demonstrating adequate rehabilitation for the reinstatement of his license. That being said, just like at the hearing, the, person, the party with the burden gets to speak last. The order identified Mr. Ross as respondent and showed the attorney general's office followed by, or respondent followed by the attorney general's office. And I do believe under the present circumstances, that's an inappropriate order. Ms. Luzon, did you have any objection to changing the order? I do have an objection, Your Honor. I will note for the record that the notice of hearing for oral argument for today's proceeding was served on July 9, 2018. In fact, that was the amended order, so a previous order had been served before that. Council has had uh, time between then and now to raise this issue. It's the first time I've heard this issue, the first time that the board has heard this issue. I would encourage the board, notwithstanding the technicality that uh, Petitioner's Council has raised, that we proceed as ordered. And have you raised this prior to this? this no, I didn't think that. I didn't think there was a need to. I think it's clearly a clerical error, and I think what Ms. Luzon is doing is playing fast and loose with the burden of proof that's required of various parties. This this hearing today should follow the same procedure as it did below, in which I got to speak first on behalf of Mr. Ross, and then I got to respond because it's our burden. It's not the AG's burden, and I don't really. Doesn't matter what the order says. If the order is wrong, it's wrong. Do we have any questions from the board, uh, either of the judge or of our own counsel? It's your decision. <laughs> our legal opinions and other All right. Um, well, I, I think, uh, in fairness to uh, Ms. Luzon, it should have been raised before. I, I, I think both parties will argue for the same amount of time and you'll each have uh, an opening and a closing. So I don't really think it's going to affect anything. Um, May I respond, Your Honor? Yes. Uh, I don't understand the notion of fairness to Ms. Luzon. This is the same format that we, fo that we followed at the hearing. It's Mr. Ross's burden. There's no prejudice to Ms. Luzon. There could be prejudice to Mr. Ross because I need to have the last say if I'm going to convince the board what I believe the true facts and circumstances of this case are. Well, uh, honestly, uh, in many of the hearings that I preside over at the Office of Administrative Hearings, whether it's a petition or a uh, accusation, we usually have the AG's office present their case first. So I, I think, you know, if you had raised it in advance, that would have been different. But to raise it right now at the last minute when she's already prepared her remarks, I think that's unfair. If, if uh, you weren't allowed a closing argument, then that would be different. Okay, so I'm going to allow the same order that we had planned on. Um, and I will note uh, that after the hearing, the board will meet in session for deliberations. Um, a decision will not be announced today. A written decision will be mailed as soon as possible. And um, let me ask you uh, also, uh, Mr. Zeiger, did you plan to reserve any of your time for Mr. Ross to speak? Yes, I did. He and I spoke about it, and I believe it would be beneficial for the court to hear the Brandon Ross who appears before the panel today. <clears throat> so I'm sorry, did you want only is he only going to speak or are you going no, to speak? No, I'm going to reserve some time for him to speak. Okay. Did you want to tell me how much time you wanted or are you going to keep track of that? Uh, he said his, his statement would take about four minutes, so I guess he gets 80% of my closing. Okay. All right. Then I will, I will do that. Okay. Then uh, we'll start with Mr. Zygon. Right now. Thank you very much, Your Honor. The order of non-adoption request, requests written argument directed at, quote, whether the level of discipline ordered is sufficient to protect the public, not quote. The line prior to that indicates a panel of the board will decide the case on the transcript and the exhibits of the hearing. 
I can only assume the panel has or will decide this case based on the transcript and the hearing. Once it has done that, the answer to the question originally proposed in the order of non-adoption, whether the level of discipline is sufficient, will be a resounding yes with an addendum that the order went far beyond what was required. If any members of the panel have not read the hearing transcript at this point of Drs. Milner and Rogers, and not read the report of Dr. Carrie Jaffe, and not read the letters of support attached to the petition, you might be saying to yourself, well, how can we trust Mr. Ross to again be Dr. Ross? But if any panel member is doing that at this point, I submit to you that right now it's misguided and not fulfilling your obligation to look at the evidence that was presented at the hearing at which Mr. Ross had the burden to demonstrate his rehabilitation. The only evidence at the hearing concerning Brandon Ross, who appears before the court, before the board today, came from the testimony of two well-recognized addiction specialists, Dr. John Milner and Dr. Dwayne Rogers, and from the report of another addiction specialist who happens to do reports for both the dental board and Maximus, Dr. Carrie Jaffe, whom Mr. Ross went to see on his own, at his own cost, and who had never treated with her before, lest she have any kind of subjective slant to her evaluation. While the first line of the court's disposition and evaluation regarding terms and conditions reads, and I'm quoting again, petitioner is a substance abusing licensee, we submit that the evidence produced at hearing regarding that conclusion is blatantly wrong and therefore the court's conclusions and arguments are misplaced. It is uncontradicted petitioner is in sustained remission from his abusive substances. Evidence was presented from those three experts who I previously identified. All of them, Dr. Milner, Dr. Rogers, and Dr. Jaffe, reviewed petitioner's history and unequivocally, unequivocally concluded he was safe to resume practice. Not one of them concluded, as the court did, that petitioner's ability to practice medicine safely was called into question by the now infamous slip of May 2017. And if those of you haven't read the records, on May uh, in 2017, Mr. Brandon, as part of the social engagement, did have a couple of glasses of wine, and he reported that immediately to a sponsor, to both doctors, to the person who was gonna test his urine within the next day or so, and for the next last 15 months, has again been completely and absolutely sober. Thus, the court's statement that petitioner's May 2017 slip, and I'm quoting now, shows that is not that he is not fully recovered and calls into question his ability to practice medicine safely, close quotes, directly contradicts the evidence of every expert produced at hearing, which the court in his own words found convincing. Indeed, it contradicts the court's own conclusion that, quote, clear and convincing evidence established that petitioner is sufficiently rehabilitated to the point he can practice medicine safely, close quotes. The conclusion regarding the May 2017 slip can only come from an uneducated view of petitioner's history and a disregard of the only expert testimony presented with respect to the petitioner who presents before this board, not in 2012, not 2014, but in 2018. Such a conclusion can only be made without a clear understanding of the past six years of his life. Petitioner has not used an illicit substance since January of 2012, more than six and a half years ago. But for one night in May of 2017, Petitioner has not had any alcohol since July 2014, four years ago. And the one night slip in May of 2017 certainly did not constitute an abuse of alcohol. 
Not one of the experts, not Dr. Milner, not Dr. Rogers, nor Dr. Jaffe, thought the one slip in May of 2017 rendered petitioner unsafe to practice. In fact, Dr. Rogers and Dr. Milner both agreed with Dr. Jaffe's conclusion, and it stated clearly in her report that the quality and depth of Brandon Ross's recovery was something out of the ordinary, not seen very often by specialists dealing in addiction issues. The judge found Dr. Milner and Dr. Rogers testified convincingly and that the number of individuals supporting Petitioner in his quest to regain his license, including his ex-wife, a physician for Kaiser, indicated Petitioner is committed to working the program and living a sober lifestyle. Not one of the three experts whose opinions were evaluated and relied on by the court came close to suggesting a seven-year period of probation was warranted. Dr. Milner spoke in terms of months. Dr. Jaffe spoke of a year during which Petitioner would continue to see Dr. Rogers at the Pacific Assistance Group and participate in that program. A seven-year period of probation, panel members, is only supportable if this board judges Petitioner as he was prior to working the program, back in that 2012-2014 uh, time frame that I referenced earlier. The first time around, when Petitioner was not ready to accept a sober lifestyle, a 10-year probationary period with conditions was imposed. Given his mental outlook at that time, he was destined to fail. Six years after he, t after he last used an illicit substance, and four years since he last drank alcohol to excess, the quality of petitioner's recovery needs to be evaluated in accordance with the testimony of the only experts whose opinions were presented at the hearing. Dr. Milner, Dr. Rogers, and Dr. Jaffe. This is not a gut reaction of the Attorney General, nor should be a gut reaction of any board members who are not experts in the field that Drs. Milner, Jaffe, and Rogers are. Thus, Petitioner submits the following. As we noted in our argument to the board following non-adoption, a three-year period is certainly adequate protection for the public given the respective conclusions of the experts. I would love to say that I could concur with Dr. Miller and that it's a matter of months, but I've been around longer than that. So I think certainly three years is adequate. Given the recency of the Jaffe evaluation and the absolute unequivocal nature of it, there is absolutely no reason to order yet another diagnostic evaluation of Petitioner. Given Petitioner's specialty of hair restoration, a preclusion against solo practice, and the insistence of a worksite monitor are impractical. We would suggest instead, petitioner be required to participate in PACE's PEP program through the offices of Nate Floyd and PACE, wherein his charts and practices would be reviewed on a monthly basis. Similarly, petitioner needs access to his DEA so he can prescribe pain medication. Precluding him from having his DEA is precluding him from practicing. Again, this is something that can be monitored as part of the PEP program with PACE. The AG's argument at page 9 suggests petitioner needs the PACE program and by so doing ignores the specialized nature of petitioner's practice. As he will explain to the board, the surgery of for hair restoration is not dissimilar from the time he was practicing as it is now. While he would educate himself as to the use of robotics in the procedure, he is not a general practitioner for whom a PACE course would be designed. And that would certainly explain why the court did not so include it in his decision. Petitioner has already completed a prescribing course, has already completed a records keeping course and an ethics course. There's no need to duplicate that effort at this point in time in his recovery. With respect to condition nine, the psychotherapy, page 25 of the, of the decision, <coughs> petitioner has already indicated his willingness to continue seeing Dr. Milner and continuing with Dr. Rogers at the Pacific Assistance Group. There is no need to reinvent the wheel with respect to his psychotherapy. 
Let me reiterate, panel members, it is incumbent upon the board to evaluate the Brandon Ross who appears before you today. This is not the same Brandon Ross who surrendered his license five years ago. He has entered into a sustained, deeply committed program of recovery which has allowed him to regain his family, his self-respect, and now his profession. While the board's obligation to protect the public is paramount, it can do that with reasonable terms and conditions given the Brandon Ross who appears before today while not depriving today's Brandon Ross the opportunity to again practice his profession. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Good afternoon, Your Honor. Good afternoon, esteemed members of the board. In preparing for today's argument, the question that I kept coming back to is a simple yet fundamental question. When the issue is discipline, what is at stake? I would submit to you that what is at stake is the paramount interest of protection of the public, which would be placed at great risk if the board were to adopt the extraordinarily lenient terms advocated by counsel. Their position is best described as less is better. And it is a position that is contrary to the paramount interest of public protection and quite frankly, is a disservice to petitioners own rehabilitation. We have heard a lot just now about the petitioner's current situation and what his experts think about discipline. These assertions are not relevant to your job on the issue of imposing discipline. What is relevant are the overarching facts that are undisputed in this case. We know that Petitioner has had a long and extensive history of drug and alcohol abuse. We know that this history has included diverting controlled substances in large quantities and over a prolonged period of time. We know that he has had multiple attempts at rehabilitation and we know that he's had multiple relapses. We know finally that he last drank alcohol in May 2017, months after he filed his petition for reinstatement. Keep these overarching facts in mind because they inform the legal framework that applies in this case. When talking about discipline, as you know well, it goes without saying that the imposition of discipline, including the length of probation and the terms of probation, is exclusively for the board to decide. And in so deciding, the board is accorded broad discretion and must <coughs> exercise that discretion at all times by the paramount interest of public protection. The law is well stated as to what governs when looking at uh, issues pertaining to this case. Government Code Section 11522 provides that the board may, may impose any terms that, that it deems is necessary to impose a as a condition of reinstatement. In the context of substance abuse and licensees, <coughs> California Code of Regulations Section 1361.5 provides if the licensee is to be disciplined for unprofessional conduct involving the use of illegal drugs or the abuse of drugs and or alcohol, the licensee is presumed to be a substance abusing licensee. For such licensees, the uniform standards must apply without deviation. Lastly, section 1361.5 provides that the board has the power to order additional terms or conditions of probation that it deems are necessary for public protection or that enhance the petitioner's rehabilitation. It is with this legal framework in mind that what petitioner's experts say and what petitioner's counsel continues to harp on today and in their written argument about how long probation should be 
about what terms he, she should be subjected to are not dispositive on the issue of discipline. Should, they should not be considered. Indeed, petitioner's counsel himself concedes this point. Because even though he's told you today that his experts have said that six months to a minimum of one year is sufficient for public protection, what has he advanced to you today? He's advanced, let's disregard those recommendations. I'm offering you three years. By making that suggestion, by making that recommendation, he's essentially conceded that what matters is not what his experts say. What matters is what the board deems is necessary to, to protect the interest of public protection. It also follows, based on this legal framework, that how petitioner describes himself as not currently a substance abusing licensee is immaterial. The factual context that matters are the overarching facts that I described and discussed earlier. These facts rendered him a substance abusing licensee before he surrendered his license back in November of 2013, and they rendered him a substance abusing licensee now, if he is reinstated. The fact that he's been in remission from illicit substances and controlled substances since 2012, the fact that he's been in remission from addiction to alcohol since 2014, doesn't all of a sudden render him a non-substance abusing licensee for purposes of <coughs> your task of imposing discipline upon reinstatement. If it did, then why on earth would plaintiff's own experts agree that continued biofluid testing and participation in substance abuse support groups be important for petitioner? Why would a non-substance abusing licensee need such terms? The answer is that, as the ALJ found, the petitioner is a substance abusing licensee. And as such, the terms and conditions set forth in the uniform standards must apply with deviation. Against this legal and factual backdrop, plaintiffs uh, excuse me, petitioner's proposed terms and conditions are fundamentally problematic. They're problematic in their excessive leniency and they're problematic in their false assumptions. He urges three years instead of the seven years proposed by the ALJ. He wants the board to eliminate the requirement for clinical diagnostic evaluations and reports. He agrees that biofluid testing and substance abuse support groups are fine, but they have to happen in the, within the context of his current monitoring uh, program through PEG, which is incidentally his contract ends in July of 2019. He doesn't want a DEA license. He doesn't want a, a work site monitor. He doesn't want a no practice restriction. These proposed terms, his proposed terms, are based on the false premise that he is not a substance abusing licensee. Indeed, as set forth in the ALJ's decision and as set forth in the Attorney General's written argument, he is. And as such, the uniform standards have to apply without deviation. Moreover, if we look to the board's disciplinary guidelines for guidance, the guidelines say that the probationary period <coughs> for the underlying conduct at issue is a minimum of five years. So when you take these baseline parameters and you add them to the aggravating factors that we know to be true, that he's had a long and extensive history of drug and alcohol abuse, that he diverted controlled substances, including from his own medical supply, that he's had a history of multiple relapses, and that most recently, in May of 2017, just a little bit over a year ago, he returned to alcohol. None of that is disputed as a matter of fact. And when you take all of that into account, the imposition of a seven-year probationary period and all of the terms proposed by the ALJ is both justified and sensible. What doesn't make sense is the alternative that's advocated by petitioner's counsel. 
That is, that he should be granted leniency, greatest leniency, when he has demonstrated no track record of being drug and alcohol free while practicing medicine. Regarding his, his assertion uh, that uh, rather than having a full clinical assessment program, PACE or otherwise, that he'd be allowed to do the physician enhancement program. That's based on another false premise. And that is this, that petitioner has demonstrated clinical competency. So as to obviate the need for a full program. That's just not the case. To the contrary, what is undisputed is the fact that he's been out of practice since he surrendered his license in November of 2013 and there is zero in the record to support allowing him to do a modified clinical assessment program. Keep in mind, this is what we know. He completed a bunch of CEs in a myriad of subjects, and he has read multiple, uh, uh, and he's read a lot of medical journal, journal articles. That's it. Articles and CEs. That's all we know. I want to briefly wrap up my discussion uh, by just touching on the AG's, the Attorney General's position, which is aptly set forth, I think, in our written argument. I wanted to save this part for last because I think it brings together this concept of public protection, which is the paramount interest here with the reality of, plain, of petitioner's situation. Of course, the board has the power to decide that reinstatement is inappropriate in this case because there's no clear and convincing evidence of rehabilitation. But should the board decide to reinstate petitioner, it's our position that the proposed discipline set forth in the ALJ's decision should be adopted, but with additional terms and conditions <coughs> pertaining to two discrete areas that were not covered by the ALJ's proposed decision. And that bears on controlled substances restrictions and clinical competency. These additional restrictions would require him to have a total restriction on prescribing controlled substances. He would continue to have a surrender DEA permit. He would have to take coursework in prescribing practices, medical record keeping, and ethics. And lastly, and importantly, he would have to do a full clinical assessment program. The imposition of these additional terms is supported by the record specifically the uncontroverted history of petitioner diverting controlled substances for his own use and the absence, his absence, from the practice of medicine since November 2013. They're narrowly tailored to those two issues that were not addressed by the ALJ's proposed decision. In conclusion, it's not lost on the Attorney General that the petitioner has taken great strides in his rehabilitation for the betterment of himself and his family. But the fact remains that this rehabilitation has taken place outside of the context of the practice of medicine. His re rehabilitation has truly only been in earnest since 2014. And during the course of that rehabilitation, and after filing his petition for reinstatement, he slept. He drank alcohol. As his expert put it, he drank alcohol because of life stressors. Life stressors. But as we all know, life stressors come and they go. And they will come again for Mr. Ross. Faced with the background that we do know about the petitioner, the overarching facts that we've been talking about, his long history of drug and alcohol abuse, which included diverting controlled substances, his past multiple relapses, and his most recent return to alcohol in May of 2017, essentially demonstrating a vulnerability to life stressors. It is incumbent upon the board as the ultimate adjudicator of what discipline ought to be in this case to reject their less is better position as inconsistent with the interest of public protection and to adopt the probationary period and terms proposed by the ALJ along with the additional terms proposed by the Attorney General. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now, uh, I'd like to put Mr. Ross under oath at this time, and then 
Your Honor, if I might, I'd like to take a minute or two of what he was going to say, because I feel, based upon the court's initial ruling regarding the order, that I need to make a response, and then I'll leave whatever reserve time is available for Mr. Ross, if that's appropriate. That's fine. Thank so you. I'll just let you uh, go on as long as you want, up to five minutes. Um, you know what? If, if I can, if I can pose on the court, can you tell me when two minutes are up? When two minutes are up? Yes, ma'am. I will be happy to do <laughs> that. Um, but, Starting. <laughs> yeah. But let's go ahead and put Mr. Ross under oath so okay. that we're ready to go. Okay. Would you raise your right hand, sir? Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that your testimony in this proceeding will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. All right. Go ahead. All right. Uh, the, the arrogance, the, the legal arrogance of which I spoke in my, not in my argument to the board still persists today. I'm astounded that counsel has indicated that the expert testimony that was presented at the hearing is not relevant. Um, and, and obviously the board at that time, or, or, or the people at that time, presented no, no countervailing expert testimony to in any, way, in any way make what our doctor said equivocal. Number two, it's well understood by all panel members, I'm sure, I'm sure that discipline is not punishment. And everything that Ms. Luzon says on behalf of the people winds up being draconian in nature, and I submit is indeed punishment. Three, <coughs> excuse me, the, um, I, I believe at some point in time in her presentation to the panel, she said there was no clear and convincing evidence of rehabilitation. That's an astounding comment to make, not only based upon the actuality of the transcript, but also the evidence and the findings of the judge. Four, much as she did at the hearing, there is much evidence placed on this slip. She is not an expert. Every expert, including Dr. Jaffe, talked about the relevance and importance of the slip. And indeed, Dr. Jaffe's report said, because of that slip, another one year would be, would be appropriate. And why didn't I say, let's go with Dr. Jaffe? Because I was a dad for 33 years, panel members. I know that if I said, Dr. Miller said six months is sufficient, you'd laugh me off the dais. If I said a year was sufficient, you'd laugh me off the dais. So I tried to come up with something that contrary to what Ms. Luzon said, less is more. No, less is, in this case, appropriate. And I noted on no less than a half a dozen times, she used the word overarching. And I submit to you that what you have to do in reaching the appropriate terms is evaluate the, the Mr. Minutes. Thank you, the Mr. Ross, who's been uh, that Mr. Ross since 2014. Thank you, Ron. Hi, good afternoon. I'd like to start off by saying that uh, the medical board has a very thick file on me, and it has a lot of negative things about me, and mostly regarding being addicted to drugs while I was a physician and un unable to break that habit. And it's all true. Everything in there is true. I did all those things. Um, but I'm not that person anymore, and I haven't been in a long time. Uh, I drank two glasses of alcohol uh, over a year ago uh, one night, and aside from that, I've had no alcohol in four years. I've done no drugs of any sort in six and a half years, and that was my main issue when I was a physician was my drug addiction. Um, I, I work a solid program of recovery now. Sorry, I'm a little bit nervous. Um, but uh, a solid program of recovery, I'm a much better person now, I'm a much better father, I'm much happier, and if the board sees fit, I'll be a much better doctor now than I ever was. I understand the, the Deputy Attorney General's reluctance to have me go right back into a practice without doing a recertification program of some sort, uh, like the PACE program, but I'd like to remind the medical board that I worked in a very niche, tiny market of medicine. I did hair restoration. I only did one type of surgery, and I did it thousands of times. I, it's, not, it's not a field of medicine that would have passed me by in the last four plus years. Re air restoration advances at a very snail's pace. There's been a few tiny advancements in the, the type of solution that the graphs soak in, um, a little bit of changes to the post-operative protocols, but I'm abreast of all that because I've been reading about it. As far as the surgery itself, though, there's, the follicular unit hair transplants came around in 1998, and that's the state-of-the-art technique now, uh, 20 years later. That hasn't changed at all. It's the same thing that I was already doing. Um, when 30 seconds, a little less than a minute. Okay. 
When I was placed on, on probation by the medical board, the, the board took into account my special circumstances of, of needing to be a solo practitioner because there's only five people that do transplants, hair transplants in San Diego. Two of them are corporations and they don't hire people who aren't board certified like myself. Three, the other three are solo practitioners and they wouldn't be likely to hire me either. Uh, the board at the time took that into account and they gave me a practice monitor and a PEP program is, is the way they, they uh, accommodated that. As far as a DEA permit, I, I would need that to be able to sedate my patients and give them the post-operative medication. Um, but uh, I would be certainly happy to have no pain medicines in the office and just prescribe out any kind of pain medicine that my patients would need. More time. You are up. Thank you. Thank you. Do any of the board members have any questions? No questions? Right. Oh, I'm sorry. You have, you have your last one, don't you? See, I was going to cut you right off. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. What I will do now is just address a couple of discrete points raised uh, by those in council, as well as reserve some time for questions if you have any for me. Council has unfortunately done again what he's done twice before, which is to accuse the Attorney General's position or equate it with legal arrogance. And let me just say this. If there is legal arrogance being displayed, it's in the notion put forth by opposing counsel that one can engage in the kind of grave misconduct that Mr. Ross engaged in. And that led to extensive and protracted disciplinary action. And then come back years later, ask for his license back, and demand that the terms and conditions be what he wants and be the least onerous. That, I would submit to you, is the height of arrogance legal or otherwise. Point number two, on the issue of punishment. This dovetails with one of the last arguments that a opposing counsel made in his written argument. And that is this notion that what the board would do by adopting the ALJ's proposed decision and the recommendations of the Attorney General would be making it impossible for Mr. Ross to practice medicine that it would be so hard that he would not be able to practice. Public protection is the paramount concern here. The board's concern is not to make it easier or harder for the petitioner to practice medicine. The purpose of probation is twofold, right? It's public safety and rehabilitation. In other words, the purpose of probation is to ensure that there is an appropriate plan of oversight and monitoring to ensure that Mr. Ross is safe to practice medicine. When there's a conflict between rehabilitation and public protection, what do we know? Public protection always trumps. In this case, whether it will be easier or harder for Mr. Ross to resume practicing if he is subjected to the proposed terms and conditions is not of the board's concern. The board's concern is to put into place a, pl a plan of oversight and monitoring that will ensure that he is safe to practice medicine and that he continues on his path of rehabilitation. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now do we have any questions? Okay, well, thank you. We'll close the hearing. We're off the record. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone here that we need? I think so. Um, thank you, everyone. My name is Christina Lawson. I'm the chair of Panel B of the Medical Board of California. Um, we are here in open session um, for Agenda 4 um, on our agenda. And I'd like to now introduce uh, Administrative Law Judge Schlickman, who's going to do the proceedings. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we are on the record in the matter of the petition for reinstatement of the revoked license of Sarah C. Mutana. This matter has been assigned Medical Board Case Number 800 2016.
2018-022258 and Office of Administrative Hearings, case number 2018-061233. Today's date is July 25, 2018. My name is Jill Schlickman. I'm the Administrative Law Judge assigned to you sit with the board today. At this time, I will take the appearances of counsel for the record, starting with the Attorney General's Office. Good afternoon, Your Honor, members of the board, Supervising Deputy Attorney General Matthew Davis on behalf of the people of the state of California. Thank you. Good afternoon, Your Honor, and members of the board. My name is Peter Osinoff, and I represent Dr. or Mr. Sarah Witano. Thank you. All right, I'd like to remind the parties that in making your presentation, uh, bear in mind that the board members have read your written argument, and that argument may be based only on the existing record. Each party will be allowed 15 minutes for opening argument and then five minutes for closing argument. After the hearing, the board will meet in closed session for deliberations. The board's decision will not be announced today. The written decision will be mailed to you. All right, I think uh, I'll ask Mr. Watana to go under oath now in the event that he testifies. So if you raise your right hand to be sworn, please. You solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that your testimony in this proceeding will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes, I do. Thank you, sir. Have a seat. All right. Your Honor, before we begin argument, can we address the procedural issue I brought up outside with counsel and yourself? Certainly. Go ahead. Thank you. In Petitioner's brief, he cites a case report and a report from the Dr. Kai McDonald and makes an argument that it should have been admitted as direct evidence. It was admitted for the sole purpose of establishing that the petitioner was evaluated by PACE. Um, I'm concerned because a request that it comes in as direct evidence as a business record would change the administrative record. We are limited to the record beneath in this case. Um, I believe counsel has a position on this and I will respond to it depending on what he says. Thank you. My position is that uh, I needed to preserve that issue for the record uh, and uh, feel that the PACE reports which were testified about during the hearing, including testimony by my client that he had successfully completed PACE at, with, at a, I think it's page 165 of the transcript, uh, they, uh, those reports uh, uh, were done. Uh, that comes to that. The fact that he went through those uh, proceedings uh, can not only be taken into account uh, by the board, but should Dr. Mutana be reinstated, uh, then the board would have the opportunity to review those reports uh, and uh, determine whether uh, he needs uh, another clinical uh, competence evaluation after that or another fitness evaluation. So those are the only reasons why they were admitted at the administrative proceeding, and my mention of that was only to preserve uh, the Wait one moment while we figure out, see if we get that fixed. Do we have any cell phones on the table? There are lots of cell phones. Lots of them. Because that can I'm cause a trade. Can I go that way? Can this way? No, I mean, move the whole thing that way. What about the snake underneath? Check the snake and see if you can move it out. Mr. Osnoff is just uh, seeking to preserve his uh, objection to the, for the record. Or, or request that they be admitted for the record. You're requesting that they be admitted? I, I, I had, been, I had you requested have. That, that they be admitted. Uh, there was an objection. They were admitted for limited purposes uh, only, uh, and uh, I, I was only seeking to preserve my uh, argument that they should be admitted as uh, medical records and business records. Okay, so you're not asking for a ruling on that here. Absolutely you're just, not. Right. 
The problem, Your Honor, is they were never offered as a business record underneath. Um, they're now arguing that they should come in as a business record. Uh, evidence Code 1271 requires testimony from the custodian of record as to their authenticity and mode of preparation. Uh, that was never done. So now to offer it in beyond after the record's been closed is difficult, even if it is only for the board's consideration in terms of further discipline. It's improper at this point. So I, I thought we, we weren't offering it at this stage. I, I am not, except to the ex limited extent that they were admitted for the purpose of evaluating if any, evaluating certain terms and conditions of of his reinstatement. That so he's offering it for the purpose of determining appropriate level of discipline. Well, he's asking that the substantive content of those reports come in and more consider them in determining the appropriate level of discipline. That's improper. The record's closed. In addition to the fact that they're not business records and there's been no evidence to establish that they are. All right. And so they were admitted for what purpose? For the limited purpose to establish that he went through a pace evaluation. The contents, conclusions are excluded. His statements in those records were also admitted as admissions, party statements. However, the conclusions and analysis in those reports were excluded because no witnesses were called. Is that your understanding? Uh, well, there hadn't been an issue as to foundation uh, of these documents, but I'm not asking for a ruling uh, from this board at that time, at this time, uh, the, the proposed decision uh, dealt with that issue and admitted them for limited purposes only. And I am not seeking a reconsideration of that by this board at this time. I'm merely preserving uh, that issue uh, for the record only. All right. Then and I would it's ask not you be really to part of my argument either. So, and then I would just ask you to limit your argument to uh, the purposes that the document was admitted for. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank All you. Right. Okay. Mr. Osman, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, although the petitioner, Mr. Watana, has done everything possible to rehabilitate. The Attorney General's Office argues that he shouldn't be reinstated, contrary to the proposed decision, because first, the nature of his misconduct with this patient in December of 2009, almost nine years ago, was so terrible that he shouldn't be allowed to practice again. And secondly, even if he's done everything to rehabilitate himself from the worst possible boundary violation, he hasn't sufficiently rehabilitated in an ethical sense because he has adhered to the same story that on December 14, 2009, he had written a letter terminating the patient and had referred the patient back to her psychiatrist. Those were found to be false attempts to cover up his continuing physician-patient relationship. Well, I will address those. Uh, yes, his wrongful conduct almost nine years ago was terrible and was met with a revocation five and a half years ago by the board when he had not rehabilitated. The board noted, in fact, that he hadn't even taken an ethics course and continued, uh, that he continued to maintain that he had a physician-patient relationship at the time that they had sex on December 20, 2009. This is certainly not the case today and was not the case at the time of the hearing in this case. There have been no other similar issues in my client's 20 plus year career. This case is unique for him. Without making an excuse, he recognizes that he was particularly vulnerable in December 2009 as he was under great stress at the time with his father's recent death and his wife's breast cancer. At that time, he lacked the understanding of patient boundaries that he since has developed very physician-patient boundaries that he has since developed very deeply through intense study. His testimony at this hearing shows his extreme remorse. He has apologized profusely and publicly to the patient, to family members, to his wife in particular, to his colleagues, and to his profession. I encourage you to read his testimony. He wouldn't be any safer to practice 
15 years after the event than he is today, almost nine years after the event. The administrative law judge, a former deputy attorney general, found he had sufficiently rehabilitated to be safe to practice. There's no reason for this board to rewrite this well-balanced proposed decision and well-thought-out decision, especially where the administrative law judge had the opportunity to see the witnesses. With regard to his testimony about terminating and referring the patient to a psychiatrist, this testimony was found false by the board in its revocation decision of 2013. He testified, or Mr. Watana testified, he understood that, that, yet this was his recollection of what he did nine years ago which is consistent with his prior testimony, which was ingrained in his mind, both in the criminal case and in the administrative law case. The essential element of rehabilitation, however, is not to change his memory and withhold reinstatement until he does change, until he agrees in all respects with a certain set of facts that occurred nine years ago, but to determine what he understands about his conduct and whether he's rehabilitated. It's clear that he understands the fourth point in the 2013 revocation decision that this testimony was an attempt to cover up this patient-physician relationship and create a defense to the criminal and unprofessional conduct with which he was charged. <coughs> and as he testified, his memory of terminating the patient and referring her to her psychiatrist doesn't justify what he did, but neither does that memory implicate any safety issues for patients in any way if he were returned to practice. In fact, he testified to a number of ways in which his termination and referral were incorrect, both obvious and subtle. A, a few of them include, he acknowledges plainly in the hearing that she was still his patient when he had sex with her on December 20, 2009. He understands that. His attempt to terminate the patient was improper. His attempt that he recalls, he says that, that was improper. He recognizes the slippery slope that he traveled before the very obvious boundary crossing on December 20th, giving her money, trying to counsel her beyond the scope of his practice, and meeting with her on a Sunday when the office was closed. This is all very well described in his testimony in the hearing that we just had. He clearly learned a great deal from his rehabilitation. He takes full responsibility, 100%. He no longer blames the patient. He's ashamed that he even mentioned two years ago in his PACE, in his pace evaluation that the patient was a bit flirtatious. He doesn't want to criticize the patient at all. And he fully recognizes the harm that he caused the patient, and he testified about it. Now, as stated in the Attorney General's brief, and actually a point with which we agree, the truest indication of rehabilitation and fitness to practice is sustained good conduct over an extended period of time. We have no such, we have such sustained rehabilitation in spades in this case. By contrast to his one week slide with his patient nine years ago. First, he practiced more than three years as an internist until his revocation without any further issues. Second, his voluntary rehabilitation efforts after revocation are among the very best, if not the best, I have seen over an extended period of time. He did a tremendous amount of self-study, and if I may, Your Honor, if you can tell me when I have about two or three minutes left, I would appreciate it. Sir. Thanks. Uh, uh, he did a tremendous amount of self-study, sometimes 12 hours a day, as he's testified, reading books and articles and standards on patient-physician boundaries. He developed a comprehensive, detailed boundary plan for his return to practice. It was complemented by everyone in, uh, in this case, including the administrative law judge. He took the board's approved three-day boundary course, the enhanced boundaries course of 24 hours, with 16 hours more of online primer for that course, and 12 hours of weekly follow-up calls. He took 20 hours of the board's approved ethics course. This is all not under compulsion, but on his own. He undertook psychological counseling. He only had 10 sessions with a psychologist and three or four with a psychiatrist who testified at the hearing. And not a lot, 
because he didn't have an illness to be treated. He had achieved, according to the psychologist, maximum benefit. He voluntarily underwent the evaluation at PACE for fitness to practice. Now, in Dr. McDonald's report, was admitted for the purpose of showing that he had been evaluated for fitness to practice and for the board's acceptance in lieu of a need for another psychiatric evaluation after reinstatement. He voluntarily underwent the full PACE clinical evaluation program. Both of that, both the Dr. McDonald's evaluation and the full PACE program were done two years ago after the petition was filed. Again, the full PACE report wasn't admitted, uh, but uh, except for the purpose of, uh, of showing that he actually underwent that evaluation and for the board's consideration uh, in lieu of the need to take another clinical evaluation. Now, he also testified without opposition that he successfully completed both PACE evaluations. He also did 120 hours more than 120 hours of continuing medical education in the past couple of years in the field of internal medicine. And during his three years of practice, he so radically improved his EMR record keeping that he received an award from the federal government. And since his revocation, he has continued to work as a consultant on EMR systems for other physicians' offices. And we've had testimony of other physicians about this. He has, that hasn't generated enough income to support his family, so it's been very difficult for him and his wife, who has had to return to work. He has earned the forgiveness of his wife. They have renewed their marriage vows at their home in front of their family members. He later traveled to India in, with his wife, witnessed by family members there as well, to renew his vows. He wrote to family members and apologized to them. He had volunteered as a lecturer to the staff at two nursing homes for the terminally ill. He has lectured on spiritual subjects at his temple. He's participated in the fundraising by his temple after the 2015 Nepal earthquake. He personally went to Sri Lanka, his native country, and helped uh, with the survival and rebuilding effort there after the tsunami. He is a changed man in many ways, but per the testimony of number of the people and the letters under penalty of perjury. He has been humbled by this experience. He acknowledges the board acted correctly. Don't turn his humility into a humility and gratitude into a bitterness by denying reinstatement where such denial is not required by public protection. Section 2229 of the Business and Professions Code, which you're familiar with, says that rehabilitation of the physician must be attempted wherever that goal doesn't conflict with public protection. Here there's no issue of safety in having him return to practice. All of the evidence shows that by his experiences in this case, uh, by what he's been through and what he has learned, uh, that he would not ever repeat any similar type of misconduct at all. He was an internist board certified for 20 years until his revocation. He was a knowledgeable and excellent physician with additional training in cardiology. He worked very hard for many years to repair the areas where he was deficient. The chief of staff and the medical director of two hospitals testified that he was one of the five best internists he had ever encountered. The petitioner, Mr. Rotano, wants to return to an underserved, relatively poor population in Moreno Valley. His return to practice would only help the public. He has a plan for return. He has a physician willing to practice with him. That is Dr. Patel, who testified uh, at the hearing. Um, and uh, he... Uh, and you have three minutes left. Thank you very much. Um, uh, or, or gave a, a letter under penalty of perjury. Dr. Patel would be a built-in monitor. Uh, the, with, with respect to the order, the petitioner accepts probation, of course, upon his return, uh, but with two different terms and conditions. With all the rehabilitation he has undertaken, why is more than a three-year probation now needed? I recognize that 
five years is typical after reinstatement. But seven years is not necessary for public protection. The guidelines for determining discipline in the first instance, pursuant to which his license was revoked, should now be used to penalize him once again five and a half years after the revocation and almost nine years after the events in this case. The board must ask, what's really necessary to protect the public? The second uh, term that should be changed is the psychiat psychiatric evaluation. The board should allow, in our view, the probation unit to accept the evaluation done by psychiatrist Kai McDonald at the PACE program, just as the proposed decision allows uh, the, probation, the probation unit to accept the PACE clinical competence evaluation instead of repeating that program. Those are the only two changes that should be made. The proposed decision should not be rewritten. Thank you, except in those two minor regards. But basically, there is no reason to rewrite a very well thought out decision by uh, the administrative law judge. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Davis? Thank you. The board's focus in analyzing petitioner's petition needs to focus on the, the egregious nature of the underlying conduct, as well as the degree to which he's re rehabilitated himself. The case law in this regard is full of guidance. The burden at all times lies with petitioner. He must deduce stronger proof of his present honesty and integrity than one seeking admission for the first time. The more serious the misconduct and bad character evidence, the stronger the applicant's showing of rehabilitation must be. And most, of, most um, applicable to this case is he must fully acknowledge the wrongfulness of his past actions as an essential step toward rehabilitation. It's a first step. If you're not admitting what you did wrong, you're not rehabilitated. And by way of background in this case, the underlying conduct involved petitioner treating a patient who was suffering from depression, anxiety, anhedonia, suicidal ideation on a Sunday in his office, on a Sunday, December 20th, 2009. Um, he offered massage, he offered a vaginal massage, and without any kind of consent or anything, then placed his fingers in the patient's vagina. He then had sex with the patient, uh, took the patient out to a casino for brunch, brought her back to the office, had sex with her again. This was a very, very fragile and delicate patient. I find it ironic that he claims that he was vulnerable at the time. It concerns me. Um, <clears throat> after a complaint was made to the board, the board subpoenaed this patient's medical records and received them. Subsequent to that, petitioner was charged in Riverside Superior Court with criminal violation of business, business and professions code section 729. In response to a discovery request by the prosecutor, all of a sudden, a termination letter dated December 14th, six days before the encounter on December 20th, a referral to a psychiatrist, um, and a note in a subsequent medical record that was never given to the medical board shows up. He, he peddled this defense at the criminal case, the jury didn't believe it. It's ironic, the, the patient also testified she was never told she was to be terminated, she never received the letter, and she didn't receive the referral to the psychiatrist. Interestingly, the referral to the psychiatrist was to a psychiatrist that petitioner knew she'd already been seeing previous in, in an association with his treatment. Um, additionally, his December 2014 chart note instructs the patient to return in 20 days for follow-up and does not mention that he terminated the, the patient-doctor relationship. The constellation, additionally, he wrote a prescription um, for Klonopin on that Sunday that they engaged in, in their sexual activities and post-dated it for the 21st to cover up that the patient was at his office. He says that he did it just as a safe uh, a stopgap in case her treating psychiatrist didn't refill her prescription. When we look at all of this together, as the criminal jury did, as the underlying ALJ did, and as the ALJ did in this case, no one believes it, it's not credible. And the board's findings of fact are binding. The board found that he engaged in dishonest and corrupt acts by covering up the sexual misconduct. His defense to this was, well, when I got the subpoena from the medical board, I panicked and didn't include all the records. This is beyond believable that they all of a sudden cropped up after he'd been charged criminally 
as part of the defense. Um, this is not fully acknowledging the wrongfulness of past actions. He has admitted that, oh, well, I did an improper termination. I shouldn't have terminated this very fragile patient the way I did. I should have made sure she was with a psychiatrist, and I should have taken these other steps. He never admits that he falsified these records, that he tried to cover his tracks. That, have, that has been found by this board. He's never admitted that. He admits, well, I, I probably did an improper termination. And now they're characterizing that as, well, you're admitting to something worse. In what universe is an improper termination worse than covering up a sexual relationship with a vulnerable student by cooking the books? I don't know. And he still has yet to admit that. The ALJ's proposed decision says his refusal to accept to any degree that he engaged in these instances of misconduct, speaking of the cover-up, that the board found and which were well supported is a factor against granting his petition. Yet inexplicably, the ALJ goes on to suggest that it should be granted with the terms and conditions. The AG's position is it should absolutely be not, not be granted. He has not accepted responsibility. With regard to um, petitioner's brief, he cites a case called Hall versus the uh, State Bar Examiners, which stands for the proposition that someone shouldn't be forced to make a false confession if they have a reasonable good faith belief in their position. The ALJ in the petition case found that there is no reasonable good faith belief that he did not falsify these records to cover up his sexual misconduct. He lied about it in his criminal case, he lied about it in the underlying case, and he continues to lie about it in the petition case. The Hall case is unavailable to him as an excuse for not taking responsibility because there is no good faith belief that he didn't do these things. The board found, as a matter of fact, that he did these things. With regard to his um, rehabilitation, he waited three and a half years. He, he, he said that this all happened because he was mentally hijacked and in a rage of testosterone. Yet he waited three years and eight months to seek any treatment to address these problems. He was initially seen by Dr. Bastian, a PhD for counseling in August of 2013. He saw that doctor approximately 10 times and terminated treatment in January 2014 after receiving quote unquote maximum benefits. Um, he next saw Dr. Kuna, MD, on three occasions, in July 2015, June 2017, and March 2018. During his interview associated with this petition, he mischaracterized the nature and depth of his treatment with Dr. Kuna when he claimed that he is my psychiatrist and he is the one I work with for three years of psychiatric counseling. It is still ongoing. That's at Exhibit 10, AGO 322. Dr. Kuna actually testified that he was serving as a consultant and did not do a lot of therapy, but rather was retained to assist with communication with the board and preparation of the defense of this petition. That's a reporter's transcript, page 62. In addition to his inflation of his treatment with Dr. Kunum, as recently as 2016, he described the patient in this case as a beautiful female who was a little flirtatious and likes to give hugs. This is not rehabilitation. This is a, an attempt to wait it out, not admit everything you did wrong, and then come back. Um, he simply admitted that he created a, he committed a boundary violation rather than the truly egregious acts that he did and his elaborate cover-up of those acts. Under the circumstances of this case, he's not there yet. Uh, dishonest physicians that don't admit their dishonesty have no place in the ranks of California physicians. And therefore, the proposed decision should be rejected and his petition should be denied. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Mr. Asana? Very briefly, thank you. Uh, my client knows, Mr. Matana knows, that creating false record is wrong. Uh, it would be very easy, it would have been very easy for him uh, to uh, lie about his memory. He, he had ingrained in his memory that he had uh, advised the patient that he was terminating her. Uh, 
whether, whether or not the board found or anyone else found that that's not true, he testified truthfully to what's in, in his memory. How is that related to safety to practice at this point of this, of this physician? That he testified knowing that uh, he's, he, he's going to get these same arguments if he testifies that same way instead of just saying as he did with everything else acknowledging what he did wrong as he, that, that okay, I, I, I created false records. But in his mind, he did not do so. In his mind, his memory was otherwise, no matter how the findings were against him, he testified in accordance with his memory. Uh, and here we are, nine years later, debating about a memory uh, as to whether or not that is really going to make this petitioner, who by all other accounts is honest, and by all other things that he has done, has rehabilitated in every possible way. Uh, and because he doesn't have the right memory, and he testified in accordance with his memory instead of what makes logical sense, and instead of what, what how the board had previously found it, and said, well, I, I, I agree with the board on everything. That would be very easy. He testified in accordance with his memory and said it was wrong, and said, I was still wrong. Of course I understand that that I was wrong, it, and he, that the cover-up is wrong. He said, I understand what the board was saying, and I understand that, uh, that not only that, but beyond what the board said, I was, I was still wrong because I didn't terminate, I, I had no effective termination of this relationship, that should not, and, and I shouldn't have tried to terminate that relationship on top of that. He had so many reasons for saying what he did was wrong and criticizing himself. Uh, that there would be no sense in still punishing him because his memory doesn't happen to accord with the prior finding in one regard. So, uh, with regard to the psychological treatment, I think he began psychological treatment uh, following the uh, revocation and he had the 10 sessions with Dr. Bastian. Dr. Kunum had referred him to Dr. Bastian. Dr. Bastian works in Dr. Kunum's office and uh, that was the testimony. And, and since then, Dr. Kunum has worked with him only on three or four sessions in, uh, in, in his, uh, for the purpose of trying to rehabilitate and, and reinstate himself. But the psychological care and treatment by Dr. Bastian had terminated in Dr. Bastian's words because uh, the treatment had, had, had produced the maximum effect. And Dr. Kunum testified didn't really have a, any, any psychological illness to be treated or psychiatric illness. He said there was no point as a psychiatrist in my treating him because he doesn't have a psychiatric illness. So there's nothing that was wrong with, with the course of action taken in that regard. Um, and finally, with the issue of vulnerability, we're not raising the issue of vulnerability as an excuse. It's one of the way, it's one of, it's one of the ways in which he understands that a physician in, uh, who does things that are wrong, why did he do all these wrong things in that week in December? Because uh, he was in a particularly psychologically vulnerable position at that time. He came to realize that. That is not an excuse. He never raised that as an excuse for what he did. Uh, so, uh, and, uh, he acknowledges the conduct as the most wrongful conduct. He acknowledges uh, the uh, board's decision in 2013. Uh, he uh, is ready, willing, and able to come back to the practice of medicine and offer his skills to the practice of medicine. He is absolutely, at this point, safe to practice. And surely, with all of the oversight that the uh, administrative law judge has proposed, there is not going to be an issue. And remember, he had practiced for three years, during the time in which he didn't have psychological treatment, for three years without an issue until the time of the revocation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Davis. The petitioner claims that this, how he remembers what went down should carry the day. I submit it's more of a character issue. If we look at the fact, the timeline and the facts around it, it is very clear that he was facing criminal charges. What are the only, what's the only way out of this criminal charge? Well, the patient wasn't a patient. I can't be charged with sexual misconduct with a patient if she's not a patient. So he cooks up a bogus termination letter. 
He claimed she told the patient, which she credibly testified that she was never told and never received a letter, refers to a psychiatrist, and then sticks to the story. The jury didn't believe it. The ALJ didn't believe it. The current ALJ didn't believe it. This board didn't believe it. It's not true. And he's clinging to it. Why he cannot admit the truth is beyond me. But he's saying, well, you know, that's my memory of it, so you should just accept that as fact. Um, well, we have more instructive evidence in that regard. His description of his treatment with Dr. Coon is false, based on Dr. Coon's testimony. Dr. Coon testified, I was a consultant to help him with this petition case in dealing with the board. He testified, he's been my treating psychiatrist for three years. It's still ongoing. I submit to you that he's not fully rehabilitated as he has not accepted responsibility for some of the most egregious conduct, i.e. the cover-up in this case. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do any of the board members have any questions for the parties? Okay, no questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We're off the record.